Hey guys, and welcome to episode 99 of the OCDStories.com podcast. So in this episode, I interviewed Dr. Stephen Philipson. He's been one of the most requested guests I've ever had in the last two years of me recording this show. Uh, So it was great to finally get him on at episode 99. Uh, Stephen is a licensed clinical psychologist based out of New York. Uh, Many of you know who he is, and the reason I know that is A, because you've been requesting him lots over the last two years, and B, when I said I got him on, I had so many questions submitted by you guys. So this episode, bar a few questions for myself, was pretty much entirely made up of your questions. So hopefully that makes it even more special. Um, Stephen's answers were brilliant. I personally learned a lot. Uh, I enjoyed the conversation with him. He's a nice guy. Uh, We talked about support groups, getting the best out of them, the term pure O, why Stephen got into therapy, um, why committing to homework sort of 15, 20 minutes a day is important for the therapeutic process and outcome. We talked about different types of OCD themes and why the theme or the topic of OCD is in the, the content is rubbish, shouldn't pay attention to it. Uh, we talked about how to explain to a child what well, thoughts are just thoughts and why they won't transpire into an act, although I'm sure that advice will help anyone with OCD or, or family member explain that to someone with OCD. We talked about relapse prevention strategies, uh, why someone makes progress one week and not the other, why that may be, um, the APA's decision to shift OCD from an anxiety category to its own category in the latest DSM, the Diagnostical Statistical Manual, and that is a mouthful. They really need to change the name of that. And uh, uh, what else did we discuss? We discussed uh, false memory, real event OCD, and some ways to deal with that. Um, and then we talked about the amazing life question that I always ask, uh, and Stephen Uh, questioned me on the term amazing so we get into that so I hope you enjoy that it's a bit of a philosophical discussion at the end Um, but yeah I mean I really enjoyed uh, Stephen and I appreciate his time and I know you guys will too this is one of my favorite episodes so I will stop speaking now and enjoy on today's show I have Dr. Stephen Philipson Stephen is a licensed clinical psychologist who specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy for OCD. He co-founded the first support group for OCD sufferers in the New York area in 1987. And Stephen is also the clinical director at the Center for Cognitive Behavioral Psychotherapy. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. No, it's good to have you on. Um, I, love, I love the way you say those things. I need, I need you as my spokesperson. <laughs> Just follow you around. Sense that we have. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, I, yeah, I have a feeling I reached out to you a while ago. Uh, I could be wrong. So it's good to finally get you kind of on the show. I know you're a busy guy. Um, and uh, thanks to also one of your clients for, for putting me in contact. I won't name drop. Um, right, right. Okay. Uh, so, you know, as I was discussing before, I've got so many questions um from the listeners which is awesome uh i think you know what you what you do and say and put out into the world resonates with people so it's good uh, i think that's why that they've kind of asked so many questions but i have a few of my own selfishly before we get into those uh the first one is happy to field any questions okay great is uh it's just to get your therapy stories you know why you kind of got into therapy and also uh, why specifically ocd um, getting into therapy was as basic as following in my father's footsteps. He was a psychologist, uh, although he died when I was two. So I became a psychologist theoretically mm-hmm. uh, to follow in his footsteps. And the idea of being a doctor was appealing to me. Uh, so um, I pursued that in 19, basically started a psych, psych major in 1980, 19, um, 78 and um at that point i knew little to nothing about psychology or oc or ocd Mm. um i became uh first acquainted with it when i was an intern uh, in new york city in 1987 uh my mentor was a person named dr gordon ball and he was sort of new york city's number one ocd expert and he had quite a number of patients who he worked with with ocd and I asked him uh, if he had patients that couldn't afford him, whether he might transfer or refer some of those patients to my caseload, and he might supervise me to develop as much of an expertise perhaps as he had. 
Uh, at that point, one of my patients who he had referred to me with OCD asked whether or not there was a uh, support group for people with OCD. And I asked Gordon whether he might combine our two caseloads <clears throat> and start uh, the first uh, OCD behavior therapy support group, because at that point in doing research, I, I discovered that there wasn't such a thing. So uh, we did collaborate on that. And as I listened to patients talking about their condition, um, it, it seemed very bewildering to me. I, it, it didn't make any sense mm. that person's minds would uh, sort of engage in what sounded or seemed like such self-destructive behavior or providing such self-destructive experiences. And so I really kind of went to work almost like solving a Rubik's cube, looking at why one's brain would malfunction in this way. Yeah. And what seemed to make sense over time is that the brain wasn't self-destructing, but that the brain was actually being hyper-protective and it was sending out a malfunctioning signal of emergency and distress that was based on, I think, a biochemical imbalance, and that a person would feel this profoundly authentic distress emergency signal over topics that were just completely bizarre and ludicrous, and that persons would then engage in rituals to resolve or escape from the hypothetical risk that was produced merely by a malfunctioning brain not by the risk that actually exists in you know one's reality or is what we consider to be reasonable risk. And so here you now have people engaging in these very life preoccupying and life um, captivating uh, escape rituals to run from something that never really existed in the first place other than the malfunctioning biochemical signal. And when I when I formulated that understanding of why a person's OCD brain would malfunction in that way, I then took treatment uh, approaches that had already been established by Dr. Edna Foa in Philadelphia, working with what's called the observable ritualizers, people who are afraid of contamination, AIDS, checking a light switch, and, and behaving in these <clears throat> elaborate escape rituals and, and very much time preoccupying rituals. And <clears throat> I took these already established uh, successful treatments and, and basically applied them to what I referred to way back in 1989 as Puro, persons whose rituals exist more within their thinking. Um, hmm. And, and that the threat was more of a conceptual threat, like perhaps I've offended God, perhaps I might molest my own child. Um, Maybe I am a, uh, a homosexual person and I need to figure out what my sexual orientation is. And so these rituals, rather than engaging in hand washing, involved a lot of mental uh, undoing or mental problem solving. Mm. And even if a person behaved in a way to look up on the Internet to find answers to these questions, I still considered the concepts to be more under the the pure O, or what's officially in the scientific community referred to as non-observable ritualizers. Yeah. So it was just very fascinating. Um, and, and, and back in 1987, when patients came to me with this non-observable ritualizing form of OCD, or what I refer to as pure O, uh, they had told me that prior mental health professionals would say to them, oh, I hope medication is effective for you because we just don't know how to go about treating this. And back then, things like snapping a rubber band when a person would have an intrusive thought or shouting out literally stop were considered sort of state-of-the-art treatments. And with a PhD, it just didn't seem that those were really well-thought-out, well-conceived treatments. So mm -hmm. I really just went about taking the mystery of managing Puro in a behavioral way and juxtaposing the already established treatment for that subset of the condition. Did that adequately answer your question? Yeah. Yes, it did. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, sort of, I'm sort of a perfectionist about being comprehensive in my answers. So um, if any time I answer a question and it doesn't fulfill what you are hoping to hear, please 
just say, you know, this is also what I was hoping to kind of get an answer to. Yeah. No. Well, yeah. Thank you for the for the permission. I'm British, so I wouldn't usually uh, correct you or ask for further. <laughs> and I'm a New Yorker, so well, please <laughs> come over to this side of the pond and conduct yourself more in our style. Yeah, I'll try. I want to come soon. Um, okay, so uh, you've asked my question on Pure O. Um, going on to support groups for a second, I have one question on that because uh, I, I just want to see in your experience, what advice do you have for those running support groups and those uh, participating in them? Um, I guess advice to successfully do it. Yeah, I, to me, I would hope that a support group uh, be run if it's like I run what's called a, a support therapy group. So I provide and some of the other patients provide specific clinical guidelines toward the patients in the group, the participants, uh, rather than it just being a support aspect where patients can relate to each other's condition and not really give clinical advice. Yeah. So I, I see those as two very different components. I think people with OCD can be extremely isolated uh, in their relationship with their condition because a unless you have OCD very very few people understand it and um, B uh, it's it's something that people have a tremendous amount of shame about and so there is this tremendous amount of isolation and so uh, if a person wants to go to a support group I think that's fine but like many posts and blogs on OCD I think it's sort of not necessarily wise to have non-experts giving clinical advice because the treatment of OCD on some aspects can seem simplistic, have generally a lot of nuances in the treatment that are a little bit more complicated and I think really deserve an expert's guidance. So if there is a, a, a support slash therapy group, I recommend that it be run by a person who has a real expertise and not someone who's taken some weekend course mm. in treating anxiety or mindfulness. But if it's a support group, I think it's really important that there be a distinction and that the members really give each other support and empathy and understanding, but not really provide a lot of therapeutic guidance because I think that can be dangerous. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then on your website, I noticed, and I, I like this point, but I just wanted to see your thoughts behind it is um, – you. In the section where you talk about the, the treatment and how you deliver it, you say that one must be willing to commit a total of 15 to 20 minutes per day uh, toward um, the therapeutic process. So I'm guessing this could be um, doing exposures or maybe some of the cognitive piece. But why was that important to highlight that on the website, do you think? The treatment for OCD is generally a very home-based process. And um, I think it's important that patients understand that their treatment is uh, really requires a, a real commitment on a day-to-day -day basis, that um, <clears throat> they understand that the, they bring home the skills from the therapeutic uh, process to implement on a day-to-day -day basis and that they have a willingness to set aside that kind of uh, daily commitment. It's not really a chunk of 15 to 20 minutes because generally the treatment involves a, a kind of once an hour commitment, to perhaps five minutes or, or maybe a little bit less of engaging in exposure exercises. So it's just important that the patient be informed, you know, right from the start that there's going to be a lot of responsibility placed on their independent therapeutic application process. Mm. And I'm, I'm I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm, I would I, I would have a guess that those of your clients that do the homework consistently versus those that are sporadic with it or don't do it, you you know, the former see greater response to the treatment. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you know, couldn't be better stated that when patients ask me what their prognosis is, in other words, what the likelihood of their benefiting from treatment is, I say to them consistently that that answer is completely in their own hands, that mm. the treatment for OCD at this point in my career, it's not often difficult to design exposure-based processes, but for the patient to work in a collaborative way and to take that responsibility home with them on a daily basis and utilizing these, these skills uh, is going to be the sole determinant of treatment success. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, 
Okay, so now going on to sort of listener questions. Um, one question was, uh, what do all OCD themes have in common, if anything? Yeah, all OCD themes have a um, experientially perceived threat. And that's really important because some of the unique themes of OCD, like a person who is overly aware and attuned to their breathing per se, or their blinking, or their swallowing. These are things that we generally, these things take place with some potential for voluntary control and some potential that just happens kind of naturally. And so you would say that there's no threat to the idea about being aware of one's own swallowing, blinking, breathing, um, but that for the person with that subset of OCD, the awareness in and of itself that we shouldn't be aware of these events is really the, the, the essence of the threat. And so people with what are referred to often as neutral obsessions, um, even those have a, a threatening component to it that's really, once again, infused in the experience. So the universal aspects of OCD, regardless of the theme, is that the brain is associating and pairing up the biochemical meltdown of distress and emergency and infusing it into these really irrelevant topics. And that's sort of the, the good news of OCD is that, uh, and that may be the second part of what is universal to all themes of OCD, is that the topics themselves, and this is highly reassuring, but the topics themselves are completely irrational, ludicrous, and nonsensical. Mm. Um, and, and so I, I tell people completely in a sincere way, if a patient came in my office with, let's say, pedophile OCD, I would tell them honestly that I would leave them alone with my young children in a room for a week, and I would have much more concern for their welfare and safety than I would for my children's. <laughs> and so yeah. to me, that really expresses the absolute uh, awareness that <clears throat> 100% in my 30-year career of OCD topics are just absolutely meaningless. And have any of your patients taken you up on that offer? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Not the, well, now they're 21 and 23, oh, okay. so absolutely, I'm, I'm giving them away if anyone uh, <laughs> you know, would, would like. But uh, at this point, um, no, no one ever took me up on that. But I, I was sincere in that. I, I really would have no concern uh, for their safety with any pedophile spiker yeah. or any other uh, spike theme for that matter. So if, if they had violent thoughts, um, I, I'm known to uh, keep a, uh, a very uh, threatening looking knife in my desk drawer and I'm happy to hand it over to a, a violent spiker person and turn my back and say, okay, you know where my neck is, if you need to kill me, go for it. Um, and to this day, I'm still alive miraculously. Just a few stab holes in the back. Just a few stab <laughs> holes in the back, but nothing that the plastic surgeon couldn't fix. Okay, good. Um, and that's a good point you raised there about, you know, all the themes are rubbish, uh, they're nonsense. Um, and, and that's the hardest thing, right, is with, with OCD, you get characterized by getting stuck in your head, stuck in the content of the theme. And obviously, behavior therapy, ERP, is, is kind of the main way of getting out of it. Is there anything else people can do to not buy into the, the content so much? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> what's important to understand is that OCD's um, heart, the, the foundation of OCD exists in the broken amygdala, the, the brain's malfunctioning signal of emergency and distress. And that this part of the brain has zero language capacity. So I could swear in a stack of Bibles to a pedophile spiker, you are not capable of molesting children. And that information will have zero impact on their conditions, emergency signal, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so one thing that's important is that we not try to talk our way out of the condition. We not try to use information, Googling, 
reassurance information, asking experts information to put out the emotional fire because the emotional fire has no language capabilities. So to develop a uh, resilience to one's own brain's malfunctioning and sending the warning signal. A lot of people see these signals as a self-destructive, oh, why when I'm going on vacation do I have more intrusive thoughts, you know, more spikes? And the answer isn't because your brain wants to ruin your vacation. It's that your brain wants your vacation to be so undistracted that it generates these associations to make sure that as you go away, you'll be cleared from the topic. Mm -hmm. So it's still the brain acting as a crazy best friend, trying to be hyper protective uh, as opposed to a, a self-destructive, um, malevolent, uh, you know, entity. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I've never heard it explained like that. Um, so thank you. Uh, cause I, definitely my own life and, uh, I've heard it many, many times from others. They say, you know, why is it when things are going good that suddenly I get this, you know? Yeah. It's funny because, uh, when people go into a bit of a dormant state, whether that's 10 minutes or 10 hours where their brain is not sending the signal, the warning signal. And at the moment we recognize, Hey, I haven't spiked about my stove being on, you know, here at work for the last hour. Uh, and then bam, the brain pops out that spike. And it's, it's not that the brain is like, Oh yeah, you, you, you recognize that I'm not going to challenge you. So here's the challenge. It's not trying to torment. It's basically saying, is it okay if I send the warning signal? Have you demonstrated a willingness to allow for the signal to be there without giving in the substantiation of the signal? And, and so that's really what feeds the condition is the brain says, oh my God, I feel like I'm having an emergency. You need to do something to protect us, right? Mm. And, and so you know, call home and see whether or not the answering machine picks up to see whether there's been a fire in the house. But to say to one's brain, hey, you know what, thanks for the warning about there may be a fire in my house, but I'm going to live with the uncertainty. I'm going to tolerate the distress signal and I'm going to tolerate and welcome the cognitive association that there may be a fire at home. And in demonstrating the most important word for treatment, which is irrelevance, the demonstration to one's own brain that its warning signal is irrelevant. The brain is designed to not be reactive to any stimulus in our world that it deems to be irrelevant. So that's why if there's a, a fan noise outside your, your bedroom, let's say, if we hear the noise and we say, okay, I'm just making room for that. I'm going to go to sleep now. The brain will actually stop processing that that noise exists. And, but if we say, oh, we got to call up the person who has that fan and yell at them, shut the fan off. And then they shut it off and on. And we become more and more intolerant of the awareness of the signal. Then the fan noise actually becomes processed with more and more distress. So it's sort of a neat way to use this therapy to use basic neurological conditioning factors and, and neurological programming aspects of the way our brain is designed, which is very it's a very predictable machine in that regard yeah show the machine that any stimulus is irrelevant and the machine stops processing it yeah no, that, that's really good and, uh, what you were talking about there is re relevant in my own life we moved into this new place and we're we're nearer the kitchen and my wife put on a uh, the washing machine late at night just before we were going to sleep and she can go to sleep doesn't matter what's going on within within a minute she's snoring uh, and uh and for me, sometimes it's harder and uh, and all I can hear is this washing machine. And I had to get up early the next day. So my stress levels are rising and each time it's going off, I'm getting more and more stressed. And then yeah. eventually it was when I kind of started to accept it. Okay, it's not going to switch off. I have to accept it. It started to almost my brain filtered it out and I could go to sleep. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So what you did with your washing machine is no different than our capacity to do that with any aspect uh, in our lives. Mm. Yeah. And what's interesting is they uh, did research during the Vietnam War in terms of pain regarding soldiers' wounds. And the researchers were going up to soldiers who were waiting to go into surgery, and they were asking them questions about the level of pain for their, their serious wounds. And what they found out astonishingly 
was that 60% of the soldiers reported zero pain. And they, they, they all had uh, these very significant wounds. And so the researchers were like, well, this doesn't make any sense. How could someone be this injured and report no pain? So they went a step further and they said, well, what are you thinking about? And the soldiers who had no pain said the same thing. This injury means I get to go home. Mm. And that wound became a reward or a reinforcer of escape from the hell of being in the Vietnam War. And so that shows how we contextualize things, whether it be anxiety or even a, a wound and, and a painful injury, definitely has the impact as to how our brain processes it yeah. and our relationship with it determines it, things existence like pain or even anxiety because pain and anxiety are almost identical warning systems. Anxiety is you're in danger and pain is you're injured and you need to fix yourself. Yeah. So with that in mind, when we demonstrate irrelevance to either pain or anxiety, we get the same effect, which is that the brain releases its hypervigilance about those two topics. Yeah, now that's interesting. That, that study is fascinating. I've never heard of it. Um, okay, so uh, next listener question is, um, any advice for a parent and teen child with the same type of OCD? Would you recommend joint therapy and in brackets as well as individual? Um, I think, I, first of all, I would not recommend joint therapy in terms of both patients being in the same therapy office because even though I'm a behavioral psychologist and I'm a world-renowned expert in treating OCD, first I'm a psychologist. Mm. And so I treat human beings. I don't treat a condition. And every human being's relationship with the condition and every human being's relationship with other areas of their life that are complex are very individualized. And so in that regard, some of the magic that happens in therapy in terms of the bonding between a patient and a psychologist is actually one of the most important components in terms of treatment success, because it's that conveyance of trust and partnering up, what's referred to as the working alliance, that really opens a patient up to the willingness, as we were speaking before, mm -hmm. to doing the homework, to being aggressive, to placing their faith and trust in the hands of the expert. So, excuse me, in that regard, I would recommend that the parent and child share on their own time their, their homework and, and, and maybe have fun with exposure therapy together and demonstrate and discuss their management of those, those concerns. So, you know, if a parent and child, let's say, had contamination OCD and they wanted to do their hierarchy at the same pace, so they might um, both touch the bottom of their shoe, spread it all around their body, spread it all around their house, and then, and then talk about managing their acceptance about all the horrible germs and diseases that they're willing to be afflicted by. And so in that regard, you can have the teamwork of the parent and child without it being joint therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so almost acting as support systems after therapy in between sessions. That's uh, right. Yeah. Kind of like homework friends or buddies. Or... That's right. Okay, That's great. Right. Um, similar style question. Uh, how can I help my daughter who is 10 better understand that they just fought and will not transpire into an act? Huh. Um, I think the best way of conveying that, when, when I work with children, uh, and that's always much more complicated than working with adults, uh, they're, they're, you know, it's funny because people will ask me if I work with children, and they might say, okay, so my daughter is 10. So I'll say to a parent, there's 10 going on 8, and there's 10 going on 15. Mm -hmm. And I work with those two children styles very, very differently. If a child is 10 going on 8, there's a lot of involvement with the parents. If the child is 10 going on 15, it's much more individualized. But to answer your question specifically, um, I think what, what, we, what we often recommend, what I often recommend, is that we model these ideas. You know, okay, so if a, if a child's uh, theme challenge was uh, maybe I'm going to go in mom and dad's room and kill them tonight. Maybe, you know, rather than being reassuring about that, is, you know, you could have some part of the homework be family disclosure time. So the, the parent might say, OK, so tonight I'm going to get in the car and drive off a bridge. And you can model 
generating these creative thoughts, is, mm -hmm. which is how I refer to them as, rather than judging them as being negative or or, or inappropriate. To say, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna have creative thought sharing time with the family. You know, so mom's gonna drive her car off the bridge. Dad's gonna go in the garage, pour gasoline over himself, and blow himself up. And and brother is going to drown himself in the bathtub. So you can kind of, under the guidance of the therapist, work on this being very, very, you know, kind of normalized in terms of that that modeling of the acceptance of these creative ideas. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that, um, and I agree. I, I like the the changing it from intrusive and being a negative thing and seeing it as it's just the brain being creative, even if yeah. it's unwanted, it's still being creative. Yeah, one of my patients, uh, basically almost the entirety of his treatment success came about after I recontextualized his intrusive thoughts from this, you know, my brain torturing me to my brain helping me out. And his thoughts were about um, his wife having still some possessions that her ex-husband had given her. So she might wear a hat that uh, her ex-husband had given her. And when my patient would see his, his wife wearing that hat from her ex-husband, his brain would be like, oh, she's favoring him, she's still in love with him. And so he had sort of a jealousy theme of OCD. And when I told him his brain is kind of like this best friend on a front porch with a shotgun in his lap being like, okay, we're gonna protect you from all of these bad thoughts. And my brain really kind of welcomed his best friend brain's warnings and he kind of played with the theme in this kind of very light and jokey way. When he totally turned the tide from it being tormenting to being sort of crazy helpful, mm. the, the brain just basically, once again, that's a demonstration of irrelevance, it really just kind of dialed back. And he got about 80% relief just from that singer, singular conceptual, conceptual re, reformatting of his relationship with his brain's content. Yeah. So yeah. it can be very, very powerful to rather than you know, like the idea, like patients will say to me, when will the thoughts go away? And this is a, this is to me a huge component of treatment. Like what I want is to not have the thoughts and I don't want to get anxious about them. And I tell patients that that is a totally inappropriate goal, that we, we have to accept the thoughts. We have to give our brain complete license to deliver these thoughts. And as I say in many of my writings and as demonstrated with a lot of research, People without OCD have exactly these thoughts. My brain is as creative and as dark and evil as any of my patients with OCD, but my brain doesn't malfunction in terms of an emergency signal. So when I think about driving my car off of a bridge, I don't have a, an emotional reaction to that. I'm just sort of thank my brain for sharing. Mm. And so the important thing is, is that the goal not be the elimination of the thoughts, but the complete acceptance and welcoming of the thoughts. In terms of the emotional signal, as we demonstrate that's irrelevance in our life also by living what I refer to as the unaltered path. In other words, having the emotional distress, going to work anyway, going to school anyway, going to the party, keeping the plans, being productive, going to work the gym and exercising, and taking this distress with you and letting your brain be the governor of whether it needs to send you an emotional warning signal or not, and you're the governor of living your life's path in an unaltered way. That this profoundly demonstrates irrelevance to say, hey brain, you were challenging me at a level seven for four hours today, but you know what? I got to work, I wrote these programs, I socialized with my friends, and I, I worked out in the middle of the day and I had lunch with some coworkers. I did everything today that I planned on Yes, you were there for four hours and it had no impact on my life. So be there and don't be there. It's the same on both sides of the fence. Once again, the profound conveyance of irrelevance, which is the healing component and the active ingredient in treatment success. Yeah, no, I like that. It's that <clears throat> idea of kind of you're driving the car, not OCD is not driving the car and you can... Right. You can do whatever you want in life, even if OCD is there. Yes, it makes it a bit more unpleasant, but you can still do it. And I think that the, when people initially get the thoughts and the, the feelings, that kind of paralyzes them and they feel like they can't do what they want in life, whatever that is, big or small, because of these feelings when actually that's the brain lying. You can do whatever you want. 
and carry That's those right. feelings with you. That's right. Yeah. And then when patients tell me it's not as much fun, um, I mean, I can only agree that yeah. life is more pleasant without the distress signals. But you, you have to take your priorities off the experience. Let the experience be the natural dividends rather than the goal. And this is what I've written about in my latest article, which I think is my most important article to date, which is the choice article on, if I might put in a plug of ocdonline.com. Yeah. Um, it's, it's right on the front page where I really emphasize exactly this point. And, and I use the, the analogy that you just used coincidentally about being the driver of the car and that you make the choices and that the brain isn't in control. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll link to that article as well in the show notes. Well, that'd be uh, great. And obviously your website. Okay, so... And I just want to challenge anyone to actually finish all 46 pages. That would put you in a very small and limited category of humans. So just putting that challenge out there. And I'll say there's a surprise ending, so just to give <laughs> a little incentive. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so next question is... Um, advice for those making progress some weeks and slipping the other weeks. Um, and then I've added my little take at it by saying, um, is that just a consistency thing? Or obviously I have no context about this, this person asking this question. So I don't know if they're doing homework or anything like that. Um, but in your experience, is it just a consistency thing or is there far, is there more variables than that as to why someone progresses and then maybe steps back and yeah. Um, it, it's funny because a patient will say to me often, I had a good week this week. Yeah. And I always, I always ask the exact same question afterwards. I said, aha, uh -huh. well, I said that this is a trick question. What made it a good week? So if, if, if you were to, if you were to say, oh, Steve, I had a good week this week, Stu. Mm. Uh, and I said to you, well, what, what made this a good week, Stu? What would your answer be? Uh, I went to Amsterdam Monday and Tuesday, which was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than that, uh, I don't know. I think I've just I've been more proactive with my week, making more t uh, checklists of each day and ticking them off, which keeps me happy when I do that. So, so I'm not sure what your is your answer that you were very uh, adherent, compliant with your goals that you had set out. Yeah, I think so because. It, it was somewhat tough this week that it was definitely anxiety for me and stuff, but it was kind of allowing myself to sit with it and just keep going anyway. So like, yeah, sticking, being compliant with what I said I would do. So congratulations. You gave the A plus answer uh, because that is exactly to me what makes a week a good week or not such a great week is to what degree did your choices stay centered in the midst of what might have been an emotional storm? So when a, the most common mistake that patients make is to say, uh, this wasn't a good week because I had a lot of anxiety. And so a patient is placing an emphasis on a independent system distress signal, not on their autonomous choices, which is what you alluded to. And that, what, that's what made your answer the A plus answer. That consistency defined by the patient's living life by design rather than the way that they were affected by the emotional systems, you know, allows for a patient to really see consistency as being under their control rather than the brain's natural variability. Someone can be 100% consistent week one and 100% consistent week two. And in week one, uh, by the end of the week, their OCD can be at about 5%, let's say, very, very diminished, almost gone. Mm. And then once they start celebrating, yippee, I'm beating it. Week two, their brain might come back with a tidal wave of distress. And I think that that's a very common and natural thing that the brain does because the brain is now testing, did you really mean that it was acceptable for me to be here? Because now I'm going to give you the opportunity to live that declaration of resilience. And you better well have meant it doesn't matter whether the distress signal is here for me to live my life and be satisfied with my discipline choices. Because if you're looking for relief emotionally as the, the, the dividend, the brain will show you that that relief is not available because you're not in control of the relief side emotionally. You're only in control of 
the disciplined life process. And so, you know, the minute someone's just like, hey, I haven't had OCD all week, you know, that the brain will then come back the next week with a tremendous distress and even have longevity. Because mm. a lot of times patients will say to me, the, the therapy stopped working. And I always, I always hate when I hear that. I even say that in one of my articles, because that often means that they're looking at the emotional side as the evidence of whether the therapy is working, not on their resilience and acceptance. Mm -hmm. So if a patient really understands the basic nature of the therapy and the basic, basic goal of the therapy, they would, they would understand that the emotional side of it is not the barometer of success. It's their, their definition of irrelevance. Yeah. So, if, if someone with OCD really grasps that concept of irrelevance and they're doing very aggressive exposure therapy, they would know that whether they got an emotional backlash, let's say they uh, looked at a, let's say someone with pedophile spiking looked at a, a picture of a child in a bathing suit uh, on the beach and, and were like, oh, this kid's really sexy. You know, boy, I'd have a lot of fun with this little kid if he were in my room right now. And so a person's just doing natural behavioral aggressive exposure therapy. Mm -hmm. That person would say, whether I get a groinal response or even the beginning of arousal, that's not my business. That's, that's not up to me. Whether I get a panic attack, that's not my department. That's my brain's. Whatever my brain's going to do to react to this very aggressive exposure, yeah. it's totally okay with me. I give it total license. And when a person gets into that realm of recovery, Often the brain does not provide the emotional response because once again, if the brain gets the irrelevance of the response, it will tend not to deliver it. If a person truly accepts the potential that that response might happen. Yeah. And yeah. if the, and if the brain does deliver that response and they really own the irrelevance, so it's just like, okay, I'm getting a little groinal movement. Um, my heart is racing. My mouth is dry. I'm feeling very, I'm feeling a level seven distress. Oh, well, off to the gym now, taking you with me. Yeah. And that that's really the definition of recovery. Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I did, have, I did have a comment, but my mind's gone blank. Uh, it's been a long week. Okay, yeah. so um, I guess we've, we've touched on this, a little, uh, I think, in several places, but um, someone's asked a question about what are some relapse prevention strategies. Sure, that's a, good, that's a really good question. Uh, one of the um, techniques that I use uh, very, very frequently is what I call index card therapy. You, you sometimes refer to them as a palm card uh, uh, over there across the big pond. So carrying around uh, a blank palm card in one's pocket to be able to say to your brain, look, I'm ready for your revisiting a topic. So going back to the pedophile spiker, let's say they've gone two months and they, they, they occasionally get little blips of like, oh, that's a really sexy five-year-old, right? They get little associations in their brain. Wow, I might want to do some sexual stuff to that five-year-old. And they use the skills and are like, yep, okay, sexy five-year-old. Thanks for showing me that kid. Sure, I'd have a great time in bed with him. And let's say that event lasts about five seconds. Well, that's not OCD. That's sort of natural brain functioning. But let's say that the event lasts for a half hour and that their brain is tormenting them for a half hour. Oh, my God, you thought that little five-year-old was sexy. You're such a twisted freak. At that time, they would take out their palm card or index card, as we call it, and they would write down the exposure. They would write down, I saw this little sexy five-year-old and I had the thought how much fun it would be to be in bed with them. And then they would just take that out and then once again use that on a once an hour basis, reviewing the spike, and once again, demonstrating the irrelevance. And obviously, by the way, just to make the point, when anyone uses palm cards, you have to put it in code. You have to put it in a, in a, in a language that only you can read, because God forbid, these cards yeah. get out into the world. You do not want that. Yeah. And I've had, unfortunately, some funny, some not so funny stories where people's palm cards were not put in code, were discovered by another person, and it has been off work. Yeah. <laughs> so the palm cards themes have always got to be in code. Yeah. 
That would be a justifiable anxiety then if that happens. <laughs> yeah. Some very unpleasant and awkward moments have come from people who have not heeded the code suggestion. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So I've got a question here on... Um, uh, I'm asking this because... Let me just add to the... To the yeah, relationship. go for it. You know, the, the attitude of irrelevance, to, to maintain that or to, to periodically just kind of bring up the topic and say, okay, I'm going to touch the bottom of my shoes or I'm going to touch the flusher on this public toilet uh, in the loo, just to be, I'm going to be culturally sensitive here and use that term. Uh, so being in the loo, touching the flusher handle, you guys probably have a funny, weird name for it. Um, and then to just not wash your hands afterwards, spread it around. You, you can do that, you know, once a week, once a month, and just kind of tweak the brain to demonstrate been there done that put this behind me mm -hmm. and that could be these little things a very powerful management of of um relapse prevention yeah so that that completed that question for me at least <laughs> good um okay so um this this person wants to know and actually i uh, Thing I do as well um, is they, they would like your opinion on the APA's decision to shift OCD from uh, an anxiety category to its own category in the latest DSM. Um, and I know quite a few OCD therapists and clinicians have been bothered by this. I guess what's your take, and does it matter? Um, I think it does matter, and my take is that I'm not in favor of it. Mm. Um, I'm not really an expert as to how that decision came about, but I tell, I've been telling my patients for 30 years that OCD is one of the six manifestations of anxiety in terms of broad classifications of anxiety. Yep. And um, whether or not they uh, made that decision because OCD has some unique qualities to it, um, I'm not really that sure, but I, I'm not in favor of it. and. You know, I'm not going to let these. The a, the APA is 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 really made up of psychiatrists, and um, there are very few psychiatrists. I'm going to be politically incorrect here, who I refer to. Um, I don't find them as a medical doctor. I don't find them to be really tuned into research. They're they're really they're medical practitioners. Their job is to generally uh, prescribe medication. And, and uh, so in that regard, I find them to be technicians who are driven by pharmacological companies uh, and the pressures that exist within those companies. I know I'm being very naughty, but what the heck, I'm a New Yorker. I've got license to be. So, um, so yeah, so I don't really agree with their decision. Funny though, on, on two points, um, and I do consider OCD and anxiety disorder, I think it's treatment demonstrates it reacts classically to our behavioral uh, technology as as almost all anxiety disorders does but another decision that i do agree with is taking hoarding out of the ocd spectrum um, in that regard i do not find hoarding to be a subset of ocd a question that also exists is whether body dysmorphic disorder might be removed from out under the OCD umbrella. And to that, I'm on the fence. Mm -hmm. There are certain aspects of body dysmorphic disorder that are um, similar and dissimilar to OCD. And uh, it deserves a lot, lot more research, a lot more effective treatment. Um, so, so in that regard, um, that, that's my opinion on those two subclassifications. One thing I'll say, <clears throat> at this point in terms of being naughty is a, a term I coined in a 1989 article called uh, thinking the unthinkable. I, I coined the term uh, puro for people, as I mentioned before, who do not have observable ritualizer, ritual, rituals. And I've gotten from my colleagues from the scientific community a really negative backlash because technically there is no such thing as pure O. In the scientific understanding of OCD, and I'm a scientist, I'm as aware of any of my colleagues that pure O doesn't actually exist. There's no such thing as a purely obsessional person because OCD always has an obsessive component mm -hmm. and then a compulsive component, meaning the escape response. And that escape response that exists mentally 
or the idea of escaping the mental obsession uh, always has those two components. So saying puro is what's what I refer to as a, a misnomer. In other words, it's a it's a false name. But the reason that I coined the term puro was not as a scientist, but as a clinician. And my patients in the 19 late eighties were really tired of their condition being classified as, and they, even patients today here, if you're not washing your hands or if you're not organizing your closet perfectly, then you don't have OCD. Mm. And I was so incensed back then. And I continue to be today that there are so many people with OCD who have this puro form of the condition who are misunderstood by so many clinicians who are not experts. And so I hold to not regretting coining that term and I hold to continuing to use that term despite getting in a lot of trouble. And there's been a lot of attention given to crushing that term and, 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 and erasing it from history. But I think and I hope for the patient's sake mm. that and I think I think it's, it's, the genie has gotten out of the bottle. Yeah. And, I, and there's a lot of people who have OCD who absolutely love the term because they understand that it classifies them as being a very unique subset of OCD and that they need to be understood as not being a hand washer, that they're not turning on and off light switches, but that they can have topics and themes that are only in their mind and there's no observable ritualizing and that this is a very special subset that, that requires a very special treatment. So in that regard, um, you know, I'm naughty in a variety of ways professionally, and this is definitely the one that I've gotten the most attention for. So that, you know, if you ask people with OCD who are pure O, most of them are like, yes, I'm very happy with the term, yeah. whether scientifically it exists or not. So one of my patients who I was discussing this with said, the, your scientific colleagues are being idiots because it's just a nickname. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to really scientifically define the subset of the condition. It's just meant to give the identity to these sufferers, that unique aspect of the condition. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, it, <clears throat> it helps people come together because I've uh, for example, you know, they could be using the hashtag Pure O on social media and that allows, that allows them to find one another. Otherwise, they'd be kind of lost. Um, yeah, at the minute, my goal with, with OCD themes, because as we know, the themes are trash, they're, they're, they're non-important. I, I think we almost need to go to a place long term where we don't even talk about themes anymore. It's just OCD. And if you're saying I, I have these mental obsessions around being violent, then you are, you have OCD. Or if that handle's contaminated, or you have OCD, it's not contamination OCD. It's a contamination theme or maybe pure obsessional theme. Um, but I think that takes the whole of the public to understand OCD, all the clinicians, firstly. Yeah. And that's yeah. maybe 100 years away. <laughs> I, I, you know, Stu, I mean, I, I'm so incredibly impressed with what you just said and how you just said that i'm i'm almost overwhelmed uh exactly and um i i unfortunately have to also agree with your timetable um within the field now there's a difference between now i'm going to speak as a scientist i'm a behavioral psychologist i i'm an expert in cognitive behavioral psychology but i never use cognitive behavioral psychology for ocd mm. Because cognitive behavioral psychology <clears throat> presumes irrational thinking. And OCD sufferers do not suffer from irrational thinking. The person who is the pedophile spiker, uh, who thinks, oh my God, maybe I'm capable of molesting a child. They're not guilty of irrational thinking because we know as clinicians, that's irrational. They'll never molest a child. It's easy to look at it and say, oh, that person is misinformed. He thinks he's afraid he's capable of molesting a child. We know as scientists, he's not. He needs to be informed. But as I said to you before, OCD is not information based. So having a patient write down, what's the evidence that I'm a child molester? Their brain could say, well, you got a little bit aroused when you saw that five-year-old in a bathing suit. And now where are they? 
So I treat OCD from a very behavioral perspective, and I don't frustrate patients by assuming that they're suffering from misinformation. And in terms of, you know, the future, I'm hoping, I'm hoping in the next 20 to 50 years that we stop using cognitive therapy for OCD because OCD patients do not suffer cognitively. And what's crazy is you know this because many of my patients have themes that mutate from one topic to the next. I had a patient who had a theme that uh, he, if he's around um, uh, persons of uh, racial diversity, if he's around uh, blacks, if he's around Hispanics, his brain would tell him, you're about to shout out a really inappropriate word. Hmm. And then his brain would shut off that topic and then it would move to, you're gonna jump off a balcony. Whenever you're on a high place, you're gonna commit suicide. And when he would go to the suicide topic and he would be around blacks or, or Latinos or Latinas, he wouldn't have any concern about saying something inappropriate. The topic would turn off completely. So he had no irrational thinking yeah. about his capability of shouting out inappropriate words. It was driven by the emotional energy. And that's why as a behaviorist, we attend to eliminating or habituating to the emotional threat, which is the entire engine of OCD. It's not the topics. And, and so many of my colleagues are just intrigued by these very bright people suffering over stupid topics. And so they want to educate the patients. This is irrational. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. It's not about rational or rational. It's about a malfunctioning energy signal that says you're in danger. And the danger is you might jump off a balcony, but the danger is you might shout out inappropriate words. And that's another part of the future that I hope really changes. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, behavior therapy is the thing that's going to improve uh, or help people recover from OCD. Um, I, that ultimately comes down to the colleges and universities and, and the clinics that are training these 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 therapists and these clinicians. Because um, I know like the, the current course I'm doing... Um, they're very good like they the, the, the people that uh, are running the course 100 percent get ocd um and they they over time and time again obviously I, I know this but a lot of the people on the course may have never come across ocd before so they keep repeating that yes it's behavior therapy or exposure response prevention the b part of the cbt that is really going to make the difference if you come Sorry. in with the cognitive piece you're just going to confuse them more and maybe yeah. do more damage exactly you're you're an incredibly well informed person. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is uh, this is the 99th episode, so uh, there you go. Yeah, there I you had go. the privilege of speaking to some great people. Um, okay, so uh, oh, right, a couple more questions because I know you've uh, you've got a dash. Uh, okay, all right. Let's ask this one, and then then I'll do one of mine, and that'll be it. Okay, so. What are some ways to deal with, uh, and I'll put in speech marks here, false memory or real event OCD? Um, it, you know, false memory OCD is, is not, as, as you said before, it, you know, OCD, it's OCD, it's OCD. It's yes. not the, the specific uh, subtypes. But you know, false memory OCD, I would just have a person do exposures to um, conjuring up the um, the spike theme, you know, conjuring up the brain's message and warning about, oh, you might have like run over someone, let's say. I worked with someone who had a false memory that when they were driving 20 years before, they might have run over someone. So to just make up um, on the exposure card, writing down the specific spike of, uh, oh, you were driving, there was a shadow, you, there was a bump in the road, you might have run someone over, you're a horrible person, you're 20 years guilty of a crime, you deserve to be in jail. And just just having a person do aggressive exposures to that theme. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is an area that's affected me, actually. And and yeah, and when I when I go head on into it, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm a terrible person, I did that thing, and, da, 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 and I was manipulative and all this, it soon shuts up. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, it's taking that leap and kind of doing it. Okay. So la last question for me then is, um, uh, what for me, recovery is about living your best life, whatever that is. It doesn't have to be something grand. It could be just whatever makes you 
content. Um, so what advice do you have for others who want to live an amazing life? <laughs> okay. So uh, the reason I'm laughing, Stu, is, uh, and I'd love to, Love to have this last question turn into a debate between you and I. So, okay. so put on your New York Yankees hat. Yeah. And let's just jump into the fray between you and I, okay? So, uh, Steve does not believe in an amazing life. Okay. I think all of us humans live very complicated lives, mm. and there can be amazing parts to our life. But there are a lot of parts to all of our human lives that are very complicated. Yeah. And so in my choice article, I, I refer to the universality of being human, meaning that we're all in the mud hole, that we all are dirty, we all stink, we all are imperfect, we're all crazy. And this is where most people do not agree with me. I think we all suffer equally. Mm. Uh, I, the only thing I can say is that Buddha agrees with me when he says that life is suffering. And he says that when we accept that as humans, life is suffering, that we don't feel the pain of it so much. Hmm. But I do agree with him that life is suffering. And so when we accept the universality of our humanness, like to me, I tell my patients, I say, I am as crazy as you are, and that's bad news for you because I'm crazy. Yeah. And so life is about, to me, managing that craziness. It's, it's trying to, on a day-to-day -day basis, live within my values. Mm. And there's a lot of gravity that tempts all of us to not live within our values, whether it would mean giving into a stupid ritual and chasing, you know, the, the shadow down the rabbit hole of eternal ritualizing and answer seeking, uh, that's requires discipline. Mm -hmm. So on a day to day basis, there's this balance between the temptation to not make the discipline choice versus making perhaps the less desirable, but more meaningful values based choice. Yeah. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I go to bed hoping that I've won more of those struggles than I've than I've lost. Yeah. So so put your Yankees hat on and, and tell me that you disagree, Stu. I'm more of a Knicks fan, but um <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um I don't think anyone's a Knicks fan at the minute. <laughs> um <laughs> No, that's that's a good point. And for me, the the word amazing um this came up two two podcasts ago actually uh and i had to kind of clarify um for me amazing isn't like happy positive it's just meaningful so yeah. um because yeah that and um, we we had the debate that amazing can can it's too charged people say uh, I need to live an amazing life. I need to whatever it is, go on X Factor or America's Got Talent. Or uh, and for me, amazing is just living the day the best I can. You know, yeah. bad times are yeah. still times in my life, and I'm just grateful to be above ground at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and even even yeah. the word best to me would would be a trigger. Mm. Uh, whereas I don't think best is ever achie achieve achievable. Yeah. So, um, you know, because you said, well, could I have lived it better? Hell yeah. Every, every hour I could have lived better. So the day could have, lived in, could have lived better. So to say that I'm satisfied that I made uh, more discipline choices than less mm. would be more peace. So, so I look at um, more, as you were saying, the goal being a, a peaceful, satisfying existence yeah. rather than an amazing one or the best one yeah uh, that that's, that's kind the of thing yeah you, when you said amazing your face obviously went like um and that's definitely not what amazing means to me especially being yeah. british we don't use the word amazing usually I'm, I'm quite an anomaly when i use it um but yeah for me it, it's about me meaning and going back to uh, victor frankl as we did discuss before this episode sure um, yeah. you know, he was in the concentration camp and he was just talking about life's about meaning. And when you find meaning, 
suffering can no longer be suffering and and for me it's yeah. about it's about that and as you said living by your values so i know that you know playing basketball gives me a lot of purpose and joy so i try and do that as much as i can i love being in nature um and for me that's what a good life is is filling it with the things that the yeah that matter to you and i think giving back hence why i do this podcast but yeah i agree with you like part of it is accepting that there's going to be quote unquote bad times and that's just part of it uh, and yeah. kind of rolling with that is a is a good life because i think you'll look back and be like you know, i dealt with that well it's tough but it was there yeah, do you do you agree with me or disagree with me in terms of the 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 kind of um, universality of of human suffering, suffering and and let's say the equality of that? Um, yeah, I mean, Man's Search for Meaning, that book is one of my favorite books. Yeah, um, and it's helped me no end when I've been suffering. Uh, and the you said about um, uh, the Buddha there. There's a, a, a Buddhist monk called Thich Nhat Hanh, who's still alive, and he said, um, "When you learn to suffer, you suffer much less." Yes, and I agree. All of our suffering just it just comes in the mind. It's it's created yeah. in the mind, and the more we can yeah. ease. One, of my, one of my favorite quotes around that is, "Suffering is the rejection of pain, mm. rather than the yeah, acceptance." The, of pain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The the kind of uh, w- what you resist persists, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, I agree, and um, yeah, and I, I find when I do have bad times, uh, whether it's to do with anxiety or anything else, I try and see it as a teachable moment. Like this is just another indication that I'm resisting, I'm holding off something, and when I start to ease into it, I I connect back to the here and now, um, which I think is the point of life, in my opinion. The, 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 my belief system is that it's just to be here and now engaged in exactly what you were doing. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. more meaningful than that. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. It's a, it's in a, it's a wonderful but incredibly hard discipline. Oh yeah, <laughs> to be in the here and now. But it certainly is worth striving for uh, on a on a moment to moment basis. Absolutely. And being aware that us humans, our brains, once again, the machine, are not programmed. Our, our brain wants us to learn from our past and our brain wants us to prepare for the potential threats of tomorrow. Mm. So it's very much against the machine to be in the here and now. And it's just important to know that that tug of war is not because we're undisciplined, but because our brain does not want us to be in the here and now. It wants us to prepare for the big hunt, leaving the cave tomorrow. And our brain wants us to be aware of all the dangerous, creepy, crawly things that might be in the cave if we're going to bring our cave family to the new cave dwelling. Yeah. So it's just sort of funny how we, we fight our cave person history to live in the now and to even live uh, this very modern existence, which is not programmed to our early species. I agree. And do, do, you, uh, do you believe in sort of the brain it evolves over time and, and, and changes over a long I mean, period of in time. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. If you think about much of our uh, our behavior, much of our instincts are really designed still as if we need to be aware of tigers being in that cave that we're about to go into. Yeah. Uh, and so um, I, I think that we're, we're still very much a, a potential victim or certainly constantly reminded of our early cave history. And I think if you think about OCD, it's just a warning signal that's gone awry. And that because a person gives in to the impulse to seek safety, it, it conditions the brain to send out more safety signals. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And uh, yeah, I mean, what helps me get in the now is just being engaged in what I'm doing. Uh, and I have to usually enjoy that, whether it is basketball having a good conversation with someone or recording this podcast so you know yeah. thank you for helping me be in the now for yeah. the last hour yeah. or so well yeah here here in the now this has been absolutely delightful um i am so shocked and impressed with your your knowledge you. of this condition i'm so appreciative that you take so much time to disseminate you know as you said this expert information so very very honored that you're considering me in that group and uh, can't tell you how much I appreciate 
that invitation and appreciate having spoken to you. And I absolutely apologize if you had reached out to me and I had not taken you up on the offer. I, I don't have any memory of it, but I, no, I'm no, not that yeah. memory. And, uh, I wish I had a long time ago. Well, yeah, no, that's fine. I think um, you did you did agree to it. I just think I didn't follow up on time oh. or something. Okay, good. It's probably Better than my it's mistake. Back <laughs> my, uh... um, but yeah, no, f- thank you for your kind words and for taking the time to be on it. I know the listeners are going to appreciate uh, your advice. I've certainly learned a lot myself and enjoyed it. Terrific. Well, if there's any, anything more you'd like to discuss, always happy to be available and make some time aside. I hope you enjoyed my chat there with Dr. Stephen Phillipson. I hope you learned a lot and it helps you in your recovery. The guy certainly knows his stuff. And uh, all the show notes will be at the OCDstories.com backslash podcast. That's the OCDstories.com backslash podcast. Quick disclaimer, guys, as always, this podcast is not a replacement for therapy, nor should it be. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Have a good week. Don't listen to the brain. Continue what you want to do in life, even though anxiety and the thoughts may be present. You can do this. Speak to you soon.